My name is Sandy Baird. I'm an attorney and a teacher. I was a long time, and the reason that I tried to get this together um, is that I was a long time teacher at Burlington College and at Johnson, where I taught history and politics and law. And um, when Burlington College collapsed, Burlington College was a terrific idea at the time. It collapsed because I think it, it just, uh, the market, in a lot of ways, destroyed Burlington College. And so I've tried to reincorporate Burlington College as much as I can on a, with no money, and I'm not asking for money, because I think essentially this project should be essentially for free. That's why we've started small, and we are going to continue to try to stay small, but offer interesting programs, free programs, for the benefit of the citizens of the world. Okay, Vicki is the original name of Burlington College and at the time it was called Vermont Institute of Community Involvement. I've added another I, which is Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement, because I would like to be also involved in international and foreign policy issues. Uh, we started a little while ago and we gave a workshop or a discussion on Venezuela and Latin America in general, and I think we're gonna do that again later. But the first thing that we're gonna do is try to discuss um, this issue of the privatization, as I see it, of our city. The mayor, since he's been elected, has sought to privatize many of our resources, uh, including, uh, it started really, I believe, with Burlington Telecom, didn't it? And little by little, the mayor has attempted to reduce public ownership of the utilities. He's tried to reduce public space at City Hall Park. He has tried to turn that over, I believe, to the developers, as well as a big hole in the ground that we all now face. So we're centering this semester, as I call it, on local issues and local politics and how to educate ourselves primarily, I believe, for now, but also for the next election, frankly. So we're gonna concentrate on issues throughout this semester with a goal of really, I hope, transforming our city. And with me is Robin Lloyd, who's been very active in this as well. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, okay, well, thanks. I, I wanna welcome everyone to the first meeting of the first series on mun municipalism. Uh, the new democracy, and uh, uh, I, um, I think if you read the back of the flyer, it's really quite interesting. Sandy has put it together very well. Corporate models have taken the place of institutions of learning, and politics uh, means nowadays the acceptance of the biggest bullies on the block who struggle to maintain power at all cost. I mean, we're in a very serious situation in the world right now, and when you look at it, we have, uh, you know, a seeming democracy in the grassroots, and yet our, all our representatives support the most horrible militarism that uh, exists in the world, namely the supporting the F-35, which is coming tomorrow, I think. So. Um, I, uh, I think this series is going to be very interesting, but we're working on thinking about the series for next semester and, you know, lots of different thoughts that we want to welcome, dreaming together, coming together and um, talking about how to change education more significantly. And this is the start. We're here, we're talking, and this is beautiful, and we're being videotaped. Thank you. So, um, I guess the, the issue as I see it, for, this is the first issue and that's around Burlington Telecom. And briefly, I became involved in Burlington Telecom. The longtime supporters of Burlington Telecom are also here in the room. That's Dean Korn and, and Kit too, right? Um, and Solve also, right? I came late to, this, to the situation with Burlington Telecom. And I'll just tell you a brief story about why I got involved in Burlington Telecom in the first place. As we all know, it was, it was a public utility, as I saw it, owned by the city. And at one point, the city decided, I think with a great deal of wisdom, to carry Al Jazeera English. Do we all know what Al Jazeera English was? It was a network, I guess, from the Middle East that covered the Arab world. And it was, fair, I thought, really bound, the third world the world of the South, and it was balanced, it covered international news, and it covered fairly, I think, 
those issues that are at the heart of the Middle East struggle, especially around Israel and Palestine. So I was very addicted to it. And I also saw the movie that was produced about Al Jazeera English, which, was, which is a movie called Control Room. Anyway, so um, at one point, though, I learned that Burl the city, of, well, not the city, Burlington Telecom or somebody was taking Al Jazeera English off the air. Did you all know that? And at that time, Lou and Andrew, this is Lou Andrews, and I worked to keep it on the air. And we discovered that because it was a public utility, there were constitutional protections. In other words, because it was public, they had to uh, obey kind of the rules of the Constitution and allow things like free speech, which is not allowed when it is a private corporation. And so we fought like hell to keep um, Burlington Telecom public and alive and covering Al Jazeera English. At the time, there were only two cities in this country that had Al Jazeera English, us, Burlington, and Buckeye, Ohio. Why Buckeye? Because it had a huge Arab community. It was ne next, ne next to Detroit, next to Dearborn, and that's why. Okay, so um, we fought and we actually won that fight because it was a public utility. It was decided that they could not censor. There could be no censorship of Al Jazeera English, and it stayed on the air until it came, went off the air again because Al Jazeera English made the fatal uh, mistake of going to something called Al Jazeera America, which failed, and that was the end of that. However, I really think that it was a big mistake in this age of controlled media to sell, Al, uh, to sell Burlington Telecom to essentially a private company. Now that private company can do whatever it pleases with the content that appears on um, their network. Now, it was sold to Shures. I believe, I don't know if this is correct, but I believe it's um, a company that is heavily like a family company um, and that they can now censor and carry anything they want. I don't know about public access either. It is to be decided whether they even have to carry public access. So I believe it was one of the biggest mistakes this administration has made, the, one of the biggest. There have been many, as you'll see in the topics that we're gonna discuss this semester, but that was really big. They, he sold off a public utility which had, free, had to provide free speech, and he sold it to a private company which can do whatever it wishes. That was my interest. There was no lawsuit about that, uh, but ultimately I, we have people here who can talk about some of the details of the lawsuit that is still pending. We have the lawyer uh, Solvay, Steve Goodkind has been involved in that, and we also have Dean Korn. So I want to, but I want, uh, I would like to have a community discussion and not particularly uh, any lectures, really, because this, this is a community issue and we should all be discussing it. But anyway, Solvay has to go, so maybe you could begin, right? Yeah. Here? Yeah. And by the way, this is for uh, Channel 17, which is uh, going to record this, which is a huge community asset also. We have to keep public access. I, I'm going to just be brief because I did not think I was going to be able to participate because I do have this Public Works Commission meeting, which also has another privatization item on the agenda about the Burlington Harbor, the Burlington Harbor Marina parking privatization. But um, the reason I um, got involved in this, uh, and I want to follow up on what Sandy said, um, I have been following the Burlington Telecom situation and, and particularly looking at what's been going on with the FCC uh, continuously, Federal the Federal Communications Commission uh, rulings that relate to d d loosening any of the rights of uh, you know uh, any of the public as far as internet service provider rec restrictions. So people have heard the buzzword uh, net neutrality. That's small parts of it, but one of the things that's just recently also happened relates to that public access channels might get reduced funding. That so I've been monitoring that for years, and, been, and I know a few of us in this room that are, became the interveners in this case, the Burlington Telecom sale interveners, and we basically intervened in the Public Utility Commission proceedings that were uh, applying for a certificate of public good for the Shures Communications doing business as Champlain Broadband to be able to operate this Burlington Telecom. So 
uh, I know Dean Corrin is going to be able to give you some details about some of it, and I know Steve probably is going to as well. But we got started with this very early, uh, I think in, in March of 2000, what was that, last year, 2017. Uh, it, we, anyway, it's ongoing. It is now before the Vermont Supreme Court. The, uh, the Public Utility Commission granted their uh, certificate of public good, but before there was even the appeal period ran, they, uh, the city rushed around and did a, whole, a bunch of paperwork and said, oh, the deal is done. However, that's not true. The Vermont Supreme Court is now has that case uh, to consider whether or not the Public Utility Commission erred in making their ruling. So just as far as the status on that, we are still, there's another document, we have a reply that has to be filed at the end of this week, um, and then there will be a period of time uh, going on from there that the Vermont Supreme Court will be actually making their uh, decision. There will probably be an oral argument. Uh, we were asked if we wanted oral argument, and that probably will happen. I don't know the dates on that. So it is proceeding um, at the Vermont Supreme Court. So I don't know if anybody has specific questions that I could answer right now. Uh, I, I just said, that I think it, again, is very important that we had a publicly owned internet because we we can actually go to the board meetings and say, well, what are you making, uh, how are you making decisions? What, what, what channels are we gonna have? Finances, where's the money going? A lot of the money is gonna be just going out of town. We really had an asset that could have been helping yeah. us financially. And right now, cities are very stressed financially. We get that because the federal government is cut back. So they have really, limited options, property tax and bonding, so which is what makes the mayor crazy about Moody's rating, which is what r reflects um, what we pay for borrowing. But as far as I'm concerned, it's not just borrowing and taxes that should support our municipal functions. We should be actually having the opportunity to do things like what we had with Burlington Telecom. So to me, that was a big reason as well. Um, but like Burlington Electric, you can actually look at what their five-year plan is for why they're gonna go this way or that way doing what they wanna do for the electric things. Are we gonna have an opportunity if it's a, pr a private organization that you can say, why are you making decisions about how you're gonna do things? You need to have that public, and, and across the country, more of that is happening. Um, we were early to the game, and we have been actually been gamed about this. It's gone back to the late 90s that a lot of things were put in place by cable, act, cable companies. So there's a lot of history to this that I've been studying, reviewing. I, w I wish I had time for a book. Um, and that's probably what should happen, really. But I don't know if anybody has more questions. I, I, I feel like I've just given you a reason why I have been working very hard to try to make you know, make this such that we do not lose. We invested a lot of money. We invested a lot of time. People went to city council and spoke. It's, we've done everything we can to communicate and we don't feel like the Public Utility Commission has properly ruled on that, on that certificate of public good. It's not in the public good what's, what's happened. The Vermont Supreme Court is now gonna have a chance to um, make their ruling based on the uh, material that we're providing. The, the mayor is arguing that it's moot because the sale has been made. I think that the Supreme Court could, could basically rule that the certificate of public good is no good. What that means to the actual functioning for Champlain is, is, an, is an interesting question. But in fact, if their, if their certificate of public good to operate has been um, denied to them, then it would go back probably to the Public Utility Commission again for a review of whether or not they are actually in the public good. And, and in fact, the plan should be that, that whoever is running it has to pay back the citizens of Burlington that paid for it. So I think it's an open question. There will be other questions that we'll ask. And, and as things are proceeding, you know, the FCC rulings, it's getting worse and worse that it's very clear that it's not in the public good to have us having invested all that money and, and have nothing and, and losing all of this public access as well. So, and I think you all should pay attention to the fact that, that they did, the FCC just said that the calculation of, of what the percentage, the, the, pub, the, the public access channels, the, the public and you know, educational government channels get their money as a percentage off of the cable TV uh, revenue. But they were just now entitled to ignore parts of their 
uh, they get credit for some of their other investments that are in kind. So in fact, the whole pot of money that's going to be available to public access educational government channels is going to go down for everyone, not even private, public, whatever, because they've now arranged to have that happen. The FCC has rolled that. Very, very recent decision. So all of these things are very bad. So the environment will be very different in front of the PUC if they say the one that they did, if the Supreme Court says it was not properly done. It does not, it violates the city charter. It does not, the city charter says we are not to lose money. The investors lose money. So it will either be Blue Water Holdings who had the property temporarily and took subject to the debt of, this, of the 16.9 million. It wasn't wiped off the books for them before they got their property. That's how it's sort of gone through a few little odd transitions which make it complicated. But in fact, the Supreme Court's the one that has to decide, have, has, is, does this transaction violate the city charter? Does it violate Vermont state law? And we really think it does, and I think that they're going to decide that. It would be interesting because uh, the oral arguments would be public, right? Absolutely. We get 30 minutes. They get 15 minutes. We get 15 minutes. 15 minutes is what they gave you? They gave us 30 minutes for the, uh, uh, we haven't got the details, but we were told 30 minutes. Wow. 15 of it we get, 15 of it they have to figure out how they want to split between themselves. Great. I don't have a date on it yet. Okay, so I'm going to, do anybody have any questions for me while I'm here? If the case was so, so obviously moot, would the Supreme Court even take it for just on the face of the moot? It's, it's not moot. Really. Any decision by the PUC is reviewable by the Supreme Court. It doesn't matter anything right now. And it, if the Supreme Court rejects it, it's as if it was never made. So they can sign all the papers they want. They can Which they have did, right? as many Apparently, they, yeah. they can have as many press releases as they want saying we've signed the deal, we've signed the deal. Uh, but none of that means anything if the, if the uh, Supreme Court rejects the PUC. Right. Does somebody else have a question? Yeah, so I actually didn't know that the sale had gone through. I, I guess I don't really totally understand this process. So it, is Berlin Telecom currently operating as a private entity or is still part of the city so at this moment? The name of the telecom may still be around. You may see that on documents, right. but it's a wholly owned subsidiary of Shears Communication. And that's Whatever what they're, they that's, so. see, when you use the word moot, the opposition's going to argue that it's moot. But the Supreme Court has to decide between the two. We argue that it's still a viable decision that the Supreme Court could reverse. In a sense, right? Well, well what, what, what happened is the, the PUC made their order on February 19th that the granting, they said that the, that the Certificate of Public Good were granted. And there's a 30-day appeal period for us to appeal that, uh, that mm -hmm. decision. Um, we were working on our appeal and working on that paperwork of that. And what was interesting is in the, it, it, there was a very rushed job, apparently, of documents. And be, so way, before that even happened, even the 30 days, they knew there was a 30-day appeal period. They had complete knowledge of that. They're, they have lots of attorneys working for them. They knew that. Hmm? They have tons of attorneys, hundreds of thousands of dollars being spent, uh, partly, all of which, the taxpayers all of which we are paying for, by the way. But they knew that there's a 30-day appeal period on a PUC opinion, an order. But they rushed around and they basically, and literally on the afternoon that they were going to try to, you know, have it on the city council agenda, we, I, got a, I got a contact by a, new, a newspaper reporter. I didn't know what was, that this happened. It wasn't, the 30 days wasn't even up. And they so sold it. They, absolutely. So they, they really, they cannot yeah. create, as far as I'm concerned, they can't create the, the circumstances to basically get out of their obligations. And that's what I feel like they're fraudulently d just rushed to judgment. And frankly, that's sort of what's happening in, in this Public Works Commission meeting, the item I have to deal with. Same thing. If you just put the facts on the ground, you think, oh, well, too bad. You're too, too late. It's already done. Well, that's not. Th there was 30 days to appeal. We, were, we, we, we filed our, some, our Supreme Court appeal within the 30 days. But within, you know, like, it was very, very strange. And, and none of us knew about it. We have a lawyer. They are supposed to, you know, they would have obviously notified us that they were going to. It, so, so it's very, very weird. That's part of what is the problem here. And it's, uh, so the Vermont Supreme Court will actually have that information. 
and they'll see. So how can they vote that it's a moot thing if they created the circumstances to try to make it moot? I'm, yeah. You know, that's the problem. When did that occur? What month was that? Um, uh, n well, no, they did their, they had a, super, they, they had a city council meeting March 8, 11th, March 11th. Okay, so they, the PUC had their order February 19th this year. March 11th, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I heard about, it, this was on the, on the city council agenda, March 11th. So apparently it happened on March 11th that they sold it up, so signed off and did it. And the appeal period was another week later, and we filed our appeal. Uh, well, actually, we, we, I take that back. We filed. We we had. To, we wanted to make sure that the PUC get, got a second opportunity to review their order and their decision, which is a fair thing. You can't complain to the su Supreme Court that they didn't do their job without giving them a chance to reconsider. So that was the first thing we did. We asked them to reconsider their their order, exactly, and then and then they said, no, everything's fine. We're good. And so we filed our appeal. Yeah. Yes. So if we were to uh, check the calendar and the history, would we find that that March 11th meeting was the last meeting before uh, the changeover, I forget what it's called, after the election? Because that's, that's what I recall. So the, the election. One, the, one the I don't think it was the last one. Okay. One, but, I, I remember a, a conversation with, with a counselor, and, and I, thought, I thought it was the last one the last before. The last one was a meeting where they authorized the changes to the City Hall Park contract, and that was at the very end of the month. OK. Okay. So um, I guess point being that the election happened, and um, the city council. The city this, yes, the city council election happened, and the makeup of the city council changed right. so that it wouldn't have been as uh -huh. easy but not until April to get 1st. it. That's right. right. So the sale was done the, before the change in the council. And I believe when we talk about the sale happening, I believe what we're saying is that at that city council meeting, the city councilors signed off on the sale, and that's what made they it. They signed pieces of paper. Right. Yes. Right. Whether or not a sale actually occurs up to the well, That's our point, right? Oh, right. Okay. Um, uh, Steve, I guess. Did you, or anybody, any other questions for Sola? Call me or send me an email if you need to. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll answer any questions and send you any documents I have. So, if, and we do have an attorney that will do the oral argument, and he's been working very diligently on behalf. But this is also very interesting to me because I'm, I'm a lawyer also, but it's very interesting to me that we've had to pay on it, and we haven't paid the whole bill for our attorney, but that whatever funds have been raised for, for that attorney have come from the citizens of Burlington. We believe we're representing the interests of the city of Burlington, and we're doing the best to scrape together money to do that. On the other hand, how many lawyers does the mayor have that have fought on the other side for the sale? How many? And they're very, and consultants, right? Well, the money that comes out of the sale, which I call a giveaway, um, is, includes money for the lawyers and accountants of almost all of the parties involved, except, us. Uh, except the public, um, including the city, uh, including uh, the uh, Blue Water Financial. Uh, all the entities that are making big money on this are also getting their legal and accounting from the city. Uh, and the city, the public, is out of hold. We're asking for money, of course, to support Jim Dumont, who is this yeah. very expert attorney at the right. Supreme Court and, uh, and you know, before the Public Utilities Commission. Can I just say one last thing? I, I just want to. I want to just thank J James Dumont, our attorney, who's done so many other good things in this city for various legal cases. Attorney Jim Dumont is just amazing. He's the one who's going to be helping. He's been helping us all along. He's going to be doing the appeal. So, uh, and he's working on everything like that. So he really is the expertise at the Public Utility Commission and the Vermont Supreme Court. So I want to. I'm sorry I didn't say that earlier because he's just fantastic. And anybody who wants to contribute to our legal fund, uh, we definitely could use some help. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to. I'm going to head off. Now you're going off and fighting with the city about something else. Well, we watched the uh, public works commission meeting.
as long as we have public outreach. Channel 7. Absolutely. If you did. Watch that one. And the well, yeah. Instant replay. Hey, Steve. How, how good is this mic? How far away can I keep it and still be here? That's okay. That's not That's too far? Okay. And I think I'll stick with what you thought we would do, Sandy. I'm going to try and give some history, not so much the, the reasons, but more how the demise of Burlington Telecom actually took place. I'll take it up to, I won't go into the lawsuit, because I think people are covering that. But uh, one thing I think it's already been noted to remember is we're not a city. Oh, yeah. Steve Goodkind, I was the city engineer and public works director for the city for a period of about 32 years. I retired about. Started with Bernie and ended with Moreau, and now I'm happily retired. Um, but I've made this issue something I've been very interested in even when I was working for the city, and I think I probably know as much about it as anyone. I was sort of an insider for a lot of what happened uh, earlier on with, with uh, Burlington Telecom. One thing to remember, we're not a city that dreamed of having a public cable system at the time or a public internet system. We had one. So we're really probably different than almost anybody else in that we've now, we've now lost it. And I'll try to explain how it came about that this, the mayor, current mayor, was able to orchestrate the divestiture of Bronte Telecom, and now, as we've all known, into private hands. The, the dream of a private system, of a public system, really began with the Clavel, uh, sorry, with Bernie. And in those days, there wasn't the internet, but there was cable TV, and his administration try to uh, undergo an effort where we could either take over or have great influence over the current cable provider for the city of Burlington. And eventually, they didn't succeed in that, but there was a settlement. The city was paid some money to lay off. But what transpired out of that several years later was the telecommunication people in Vermont, not just the cable company, and the friends in the legislature put a provision in the city uh, charter they basically said that in the future, no taxpayer money could be placed at risk for any venture that involved establishing a cable television system or something like it. So that poison pill was put into our charter. I think it's actually state law now for everybody, but it was specifically put into our charter. And that was meant really to discourage the activist city of Burlington from trying to establish their own, own system. Anyway, uh, when Peter Clavel was mayor around 2000, they began looking at what could be done. And at this point in time, the internet and that type of system was sort of uh, coming over the horizon. They realized the potential of it and the idea that maybe this should be a public system seemed like a good idea. It seemed like a good idea, in fact, that our electric department would be the logical place for such a system to be operated out on behalf of the, the citizens of Burlington. Anyway, they explored that. They explored the BED option. That option was eventually rejected. But Mayor Clavel did establish through the school department, or with the school department, they established what they called the backbone of a fiber optic system. It was a small system, but it served parts of city government, part of the high school. And he arranged for a $22 million loan from a private entity. And that's where the capital came from. Because again, the capital could not come from taxpayer dollars. So they set up this public-private kind of a, an operation. Then they hired a fellow named Tim Nolte. And if you heard the name, Tim Nolte is the person almost entirely responsible for the financial demise of Burlington Telecom. He ran the system. He was in charge of not only operating the, the system as a deliverer of cable services, but also of building the system. He only had the backbone when he came on board. His job was to finish it out throughout the whole city. And he turned out to be woefully unqualified to do that. But he was, uh, he was a music man. He said what he thought people wanted to hear. And nobody was really watching what he was doing. And uh, just a sideline, when he would report at various department head meetings that the mayor would hold, a like cabinet meeting, I was part of that group, he'd report on what he was doing. And my bullshit meter went way over. No one else's did, it seemed. And I would question him and try and get some interest, even from the mayor, that this wasn't going well, something wasn't right. Nobody would listen. So Tim is out there doing what he wants to. Most of the time, no one's even asking the hard questions about how he's doing it, how the money's being spent, what his plans are. And his plans were quite grandiose. He had plans not just for establishing a system in Burlington, but he was building a network that could have served all of Chittenden County. 
which was a way big of an overreach compared to the resources that were available and what his real charge was. So anyway, uh, eventually Clavel doesn't run, Kiss is elected mayor, a new CAO comes in, Jonathan Leopold, and I know Jonathan for quite a while, and I talked to him a little bit about BT, and he was concerned about it, but at that time, he had, at least we thought, he had bigger fish to fry. When he became the CAO, the uh, best way you can describe it is the financial cupboards of Burlington were pretty bare. Most people don't realize that. The financial cupboards were bare. He had to spend a lot of time just getting the financial situation back on a decent track. And problems with specifics like Burlington Telecom, that could wait. Turned out to be an unfortunately fatal mistake. But he didn't pay much attention to it for the first year or so. Then when he thought things were somewhat under control with the city finances, he began to focus on Burlington Telecom. And he looked at the books, and remember I said there was $22 million worth of capital that was available. He began looking at the books and realizing they had spent $29 million. You think, well, how does that happen? Well, it happens because we have something called the cash pool in the city of Burlington, and departments basically would borrow money short term from the cash pool to pay their bills and then pay it back, but no one was watching it that carefully. So Burlington Telecom was literally just writing checks once the $22 million was gone, they just kept writing checks, and the cash pool kept honoring those checks. So Jonathan went to Tim Nolte and said, Tim, how is, uh, how is this possible? How could you have overspent? And by the way, the system wasn't even close to being built out at this point. Maybe it was half built, maybe not even. Tim says, no, that's not possible. I'm, I'm sure there's got to be a mistake here. He goes back to his office and over the weekend studies it, comes back to Jonathan the next week and says, you're right. We spent about $29 million and we've essentially, without realizing it, have borrowed this money from the city's cash pool. Now, one side note, by the way, is you can always question how well Jonathan did with the city finances, but the fact that this money was in the cash pool to be borrowed showed what a turnaround he had made in the city finances. Had this happened a year or two earlier, there wouldn't have been any money in the cash pool to borrow against. So he'd gotten back on a healthy standing, but unfortunately that money was now there to get misappropriated toward uh, Burlington Telecom. Well, it was, Tim Nolte went through the system, but it wasn't appropriated properly. I don't know how, I won't get into the details of how you're supposed to get a bill paid. Mm -hmm. he, I don't think he was doing it correctly. Mm -hmm. He was submitting them, but he wasn't getting authorization. They were honoring that, and then the authorization would come later. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost not even worth worrying about. It wasn't good. Anyway, the solution was Jonathan went out and secured an additional $11 million, and so now they had $33 million. By the time that money arrived, Tim Nolte had spent about $39 million. So he just kept spending and spending. He really was out of control. His control over contractors, his control over staff, his control over all expenses was just wildly out of control. So very quickly, they, were, they exceeded again what, what funding they had available. And again, the cash pool had, been, had come into play. And make a long story short, before it was over with and Tim Nolte was sent out the door, the city had about $17 million of cash pool money in addition to the $33 million that the private equity people had put into the program for a total of about 50, I always say $52 million in the end. That's what was spent. The system had about 4,000 customers. So this was over $10,000 per customer, something that no entity in the communication field would ever even conceive of doing, spending that much per customer. But that's, that's where they were at. And of course, eventually this became a little more widely known what had happened. The city council became alarmed at it. It was probably, I'm not saying probably, it was the deb demise of Bob Kiss. Uh, yeah. Mayor Weinberger ran on the fact he was gonna clean this up and how incompetent the mayor was. And Mayor Weinberger was elected. Even though before Kiss left office, they began to negotiate with the main lender, which was City Financial, C-I-T-I -I Financial. They were the main lender. Uh, and by the way, we're, we're no longer in the business of lending money for these kind of projects by the time this happened. When Jonathan went to uh, see about getting more money, they said, we don't do this anymore. So a lot of doors were closed as far as money being unavailable for anything to do with te uh, our telecom system. Anyway, so they, they began to negotiate with City Financial and it kind of reached a stalemate. New mayor came in. He picked up where they left off, basically with the same kind of a, an idea. Maybe a settlement could be made where they would get a half or a third of their $33 million and just call it a day, take the loss, they're a big company. And in the end, 
something like that actually did happen. It just took three or four years for everyone to be so worn down that uh, City Financial agreed to a deal. The deal was that of the 33 million they were owed, they would get 10.5 million. And, and keep this word if in big letters, if the system were ever sold, that City Financial would get half of the net proceeds from the sale once all expenses were paid, and all the bills were paid, whatever so-called profit or remaining uh, funds there were, City Financial would get half of that. But they also said that if it wasn't sold, that they would not um, unreasonably withhold their approval of a non-sale agreement. In other words, the city, whatever the city did, they sort of had to approve it, but they did not require, and this was something not understood by most people at the time, they did not require this thing to be sold. And it's very clear. And in fact, the mayor used to say for a long time that it was city financial that forced the sale. He doesn't say that anymore, because it wasn't true. It wasn't even close to being true. So the city has to come up now with $10.5 million to uh, to if, come up with their part of the... Steve, could, could you just repeat that last part, sort of speaking slowly, because I, the, the part where city, I know, but I, I'd like to understand. City Financial agrees to a deal, and they're going right. to get, they're going to get paid ten and a half million dollars, and they're going to get half of any sale of the city ever decides to sell the system, half of the so-called profits of that would go to City Financial. But they did not require that that actually happened. They did not require there to be a sale. Okay. And that's yeah. it's in the it's right in the document. It does not require it, even though the mayor used to say that it did. It did not. Yeah, he did. I'll just get it. Yes. That's, exact, that's how we yeah. won. But also now again, there's ten and a half million dollars for the settlement. The city has to come up with this money. The city comes up with four and a half million. Three million comes from probably was illegal. I think it is. But this illegal? illegal somehow taxpayers' money, taxpayers' assets yeah, yeah, yeah. raised three million. There was a legal settlement with the city attorneys, a malpractice settlement that came up with a million and a half. And then there was six million more to come up with of the ten and a half million. The city, instead of going out, just going to a bank and borrowing it. That's what you do. This is where the mayor begins to play his game and orchestrate the forced sale of Burlington Telecom. He goes out and looks for something different. And the people that are now managing the system, a company called Dorman and Fawcett, they come back with uh, an option. I think the company was called Rosemount. Rosemount is a liquidation company. They buy, I don't think they ever buy municipal stuff, but they buy properties and they basically uh, run them for a while, liquidate them and get their money out. They don't care that millions are lost by others. That's, they're in the business of liquidation. And they come up with a, a plan. The mayor looks at the plan and thinks, well, there's nothing really so complicated about this. Maybe there's someone locally that would want to do this. And he finds Trey Pecor. And they basically, they give Trey Pecor the confidential proposal from Rosemount and say, can you do this? And Trey looks at it and says, well, yeah, I can do this. He changed it a little bit. But uh, he comes up with a proposal which it's almost the same. The only difference is now Dorman and Fawcett, our trusted managers, are also going to get a cut of the profits. In addition to Trey Pico getting half of it in City Financial and the City of Burlington splitting their half. Um, and if you think, again, that what the mayor did was appropriate, the city paid Rosemount $75,000 in damages because they basically stole their proposal. and It wasn't supposed to be released. So this is, everything is underhanded about this. They fed them a confidential proposal and then they had to pay a, a penalty for having done so. So anyway, now Trey Pecor enters the picture. What Trey Pecor does is he goes to the Merchants Bank and says, I'll co-sign on a $6 million loan if you will lend the city of Burlington $6 million. Now, we could have gotten that. Mm -hmm. We definitely could have gotten that. There's no question about it. And even if the interest rate was a little bit higher, when you see how much Trey Pecor's profit was on this thing, you realize that the interest rate had been 100% it would have been a bargain compared to what we paid him. So anyway, uh, so now it's a deal. But, but now the deal is even more complicated, though, because as I mentioned, Rosemont was a liquidating firm. They had no interest in really running the system. So what their deal was is they were going to buy, they would buy Burlington Telecom. Then they would 
allow the city to direct a sale. In other words, the city could try and find another buyer to take it over, pay them back. Uh, but the longer the city took to do that, the less of the profits the city could keep. In other words, if they sold it within three years, the city could keep half the profits. If they sold it within four years, it was 35%, then 25%, and then finally like 5%, and finally zero. So that's where this forced sale, or the idea that it had to be sold, because if it wasn't sold, eventually if you did sell it, you weren't gonna get anything for it. So that's where they came in with this idea that it had to be sold. It came from Rosemount, but then Picor, when he was fed the deal, he just picked up on that. He used the same numbers, he used everything just about the same. A few little tweaks here and there, because now, as I said, Dorman and Fawcett was also included and how that could happen, how your trusted advisor all of a sudden could have their fingers in the pie. Just one more crooked deal in the whole thing. So anyway, we're getting close to how this, this all sort of ends, I think, as we know. So they, now there is something which is really pushing the sale. Again, if we don't do it, if we don't sell it, eventually, I forgot to mention this, if we decide not to sell it after so many years, then, Dor then PCOR could do whatever he wants with it also. We would even lose the right to kind of direct the sale. Now, there was one other piece to it also, just again to show how sneaky they are. Can I just point out something there? You were talking about how the mayor often said it was City who drove the sale. Yes. And it was really this agreement that they signed with PCOR. After the City for, the, After the City deal that forced the sale eventually. Oh, Why correct. don't you say correct. who you are? Yeah, I'm Alan Matson. Yeah. Um, I was quite involved in trying to find a local solution for purchasing Burlington Telecom through the whole transaction. And I kind of wanted to point that difference out because I thought it was, yeah. it is an important point. That if, was it was, if it was just city. I was involved with the co-op that was trying to create a local purchase for right. this. Probably so if it was just. The ownership within it, the uh, community. If yeah. it was just city financial involved, we'd probably still own Burlington Telecom today. They did not force the sale. The PCOR deal which was a deal basically fed to PCOR by the city to take, that's what did everything to force this sale. And it, up until then, probably we're gonna be all right. So, in the, but there's one more piece also to the sale agreement. There was a side note, a condition where PCOR set a minimum sale price that he would accept. Even if the city found a buyer, PCOR had the right to say, there was a certain reserve clause that they could not sell it for less than a certain amount. So in other words, guaranteeing that if they ever sold it, he would make a certain amount of money. That was meant to be uh, a confidential document, but in one of the PUC hearings to approve the sale to PCOR, one of the commissioners actually read the PCOR letter with the request in it. The amount was $11 million. And then as soon as he did that, they realized it and they asked that to be struck from the record and it's never been, the city has never divulged it. I've mentioned it a few times, but that's how they operated. We could never know, the public was never to know what the real sale to PCOR meant and what he had into it. In the end, they went through this process and they did it as quick as they could so that they would get the maximum of the uh, proceeds from the sale. And again, the way it's divided up is the city of Burlington gets half the proceeds, but we have to split our half with city financial as per the previous agreement. PCOR gets 40%, Dorman and Fawcett gets 10%. In the end, when it was sold for about $33 million, uh, PCOR got about 10 or so. The city got five and a half, city of financial got about five and a half, Dorman and Fawcett got, I think it was 1.6 million, something like that. But, again, you wonder how outrageous this thing could be. There's two more things, two more things that happened. 4.7. It was a 4.7? What's 4.7? 4.7 million to Dorman. Dorman, in the end. But there's one more piece of it, and again, to show how crooked these guys are. Not in the city financial deal, but in the PCOR deal, there's a provision that called for the dividing up of any remaining cash assets that Burlington Telecom might have. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute, this was a poor company. It was doing so poorly. There couldn't be much cash laying around. When the sale was made, and after Shures had put in their money and cleared the debts and the money had been divided up, there was this pot of money, cash assets of $6.6 .6 million in Burlington Telecom. Strangely enough, that $6.6 .6 million was more than the $6 million that the city would have had to borrow. But anyway, there was $6.6 .6 million. And this, again, nothing to do with Shures. PCOR, Darwin and Fawcett, Citibank, and the city of Burlington divided that up. That was 
just ratepayers' money, maybe taxpayers' money. Nothing to do with the sale, just looted it. And if you remember, at the time when the city agreed to sell the shares, within a week of that, they announced a rate increase. Rate increase? A rate increase. And I think it was to cover some extra costs of buying cable shows or something. Anyway, that money included this rate increase. So here they were sitting on a pot of money and ask for a rate increase, what they really were doing was just getting that pot of money up as big as they could before the sale so the thieves could divide it up. And that's exactly what they did. And 6.6 .6 million was looted from the ratepayers and maybe the taxpayers of Burlington when that thing was done. Nothing to do with shares, this was just hands in the piggy bank. And uh, each of them got many, many millions more from that sale, when from that looting and not a sale. When did they request and get that rate increase? Right at, it was like within a week of agreeing to sell the shares. They went back and announced the rate increase. And they and oh. uh, the city did. to sell to shares. Right after the sale of shares was announced, the city went back. Before the sale was consummated, they said, we're going to sell to shares. And then the city went back and said, we're going to get a rate increase now. We need one. They didn't need one. And that fact, they had $6.6 million, $6 million in the kitty a year later. They definitely didn't need one. So, but so that's I how they operated. So just if, robbers. So if, if Burlington Telecom was in such trouble, what was the six thousand six million dollars? How did they have that? They ran the system. Dorman and Fawcett ran it on behalf of PCOR. And I think they ran yeah. it to maximize the cash value, the cash assets at the time of the sale so they could get their mitts on it. Shures wasn't going to get that right. money. Basically, they did an okay job or not when they ran it. I Maybe mean, they did all right, but they certainly had a lot more money than yeah, they yeah. needed. Yeah, I think they did an okay job. Well, they, yeah. Yeah. And it's okay. Which meant it could have recovered, right? The, well, the, the could have, it had definitely recovered. recovered. Yeah. It, had re it, it had recovered, and it, in this period of incredible turmoil and constant bad-mouthing by yeah. people running for office, exactly. how, how you know, $16.9 million was taken from uh, taxpayers illegally, and the promise was to pay it back. Yeah. Um, while during all that was happening, over a three year period, they went from 4,000 subscribers to 7,000 subscribers. Mm -hmm. So they, yeah. they. And they'd accumulated quite a bit of cash. Yeah, right. Which eventually the, they divided amongst themselves. What oh, they could have done is they could have even. If they, if they got the rate increase, then they realized they didn't need it. They could have even given it back. They could have given it back as a. Uh, to customers, it's just sometimes done. But they kept it for themselves, and it was just, as far as I'm concerned, it was just thievery. No way that should have happened. So in terms of how well they did, um, Dorman and Fawcett did not run the company. They hired a really good manager. They I ran it. Get his name. No, Derek he was one of their employees. What? Well, he was Dorman and Fawcett employee. Who, okay. who was it? Steve yeah, Barakal. Yeah, right. I mean, I'm just saying that my understanding is that it was his skill as yeah. a manager that... Well, right. I won't knock his skill as a manager one way or the other, but when he arrived here and he was hired during the KISS administration, he didn't know anything about telecom. He learned it all here. He had managerial skills of some sort, but he did not come here as some kind of a uh, cable or internet system operator. He learned it here. Well, I remember him admitting that. Yeah. The, yeah. But, but the fact is, he was a good manager. I'm just throwing right, that yeah. out because the way it was worded before, yeah. it was as if Dorman and Fawcett somehow did the work for BT to um, do well over those years. So well that they got a, that they accumulated all this cash and then took it. Yeah. So well. Tony. Tony. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Yeah, well, go ahead, Tony. Okay, Steve. Uh, Tony Redding. Um, when I heard you just explain, there was only one person who has 100% responsibility for the loss of going to telecom, who led the, the PCOR agreement, which then basically it was, a, it was a slippery slope down from that point. And that happens to be Laura Weinberg, right. is that correct? Pretty much. It was Tim Nolte who led to its financial problems, but, but then Weinberger made the decision he was going to get rid of it, and he did. Okay. I'm not, I'm not worried about this. Okay, that's all I want. Yeah. Good point. But, yeah, yeah. But, there, but there, he used it, Robin. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. 
So uh, about this Tim Nolte, you say he was um, he was responsible for the demise and he was out of control. Now, what does out of control really mean? I mean, no one was watching what he was doing, and he was spending money like a drunken sailor. Okay, but wasn't there was no commission? B BT had to expand, right, to be viable, and I mean, in other words, were we? Um, were we, did we have a, a sort of hubris to think that we could do, uh, that we could publicly run uh, Burlington Telecom? Well, if they had some people that had given the impression that they could build the system for the money that they had, and they thought they would build it, and as it grew, customers would be paying into the system, and they would keep using that money and kind of roll it over. So it was like a, not perpetual motion machine, but the idea that it would sort of grow itself. That was wrong, but that was wrong. but it, it couldn't do it. It couldn't be done. Seems reasonable, but it's not at, not at, not was needed. We had no system at all. You're basically saying that the customers, a small customer base, is going to build a system for a bigger customer base? Not possible. And and Tim Nolte was the wrong person to do it, even if it could be done. He wasn't the guy to so do it. So we had to borrow to make it work. We had well, we borrowed 22 million, yeah. which he spent 29 million of. Then we bought another 11 million, which he spent 39 million on. Mm. Then we spent another 17 million for a total of about 52 million, and still didn't finish the job. It was a financial disaster. But in the end, years down the road, when it was finally sold, it was doing pretty well, and it actually had enough money in the bank to have paid off all its debts and have six and a half for 6.6 .6 million dollars left, and that could have been ours. Should have been ours. <coughs> Tony, or Jack, I think Jack was next. Mm -hmm. the, the bottom line is that we had a public utility. You know, Burlington Electric Department started in 1905, struggled for many, many, many years. Uh, and now we got to the point where it was so successful meeting the actual needs of Burlingtonians, not you know, anyone else's, but our needs for reasonable rates, good service, environmental uh, awareness, uh, and uh, operated in a democratic way, uh, but struggled for many, many years. Here we had a utility that started out uh, and in some ways did well, in some ways did horrendously bad, wasted a lot of money, um, had no financial controls, and that did it damage from which it could fully recover. Yeah, uh, and so it, it wasn't Citibank that did it. it. It was really the, as you say, Tony, the uh, the political decision on the part of the mayor Correct. to destroy the utility. That's right. Uh, and it never had to happen. There was a financing that could have happened uh, early on in the process. Uh, and uh, so, really, you used the word looting, which. Yep. That's what I, for that I, last 6.6 million, that was looted. I've, I've been working on this for years, and every time I hear Steve, I, I learn something new. And looting is really the right word. And the other word that I think of with regard to this is sabotage. Uh, this could yeah. have been saved Correct. at many stages along the way. Uh, and its demise was intentional. But I would remember, remind people that it is not over. Hopefully not. Uh, and. Fortunately, on our side, we have very clear law, as, as Solve said, both in statute and in our charter. Uh, and uh, the PUC completely ignored the law. The Department of Public Service, that's supposed to work representing us, uh, completely ignored the law and ignored many other things. Uh, and uh, we uh, are hoping. Uh, and we're hoping that it's a good sign that they're having oral argument because yeah, yeah. they don't always yeah. do that. Uh, we are hoping that the Supreme Court will simply follow the plain letter of the law. And I'll point out that they just issued a decision, a landmark decision, uh, a few days ago, requiring uh, state public records to be provided free of charge uh. for inspection, which is what the law says. Yeah. Uh, but every department has been charging uh, people. Uh, I'm personally aware of this myself. And uh, uh, they said, 
there are all these things we don't even have to deal with. We're looking at the plain language in the law. The law says this is what you're going to do. This is how we're going to behave. It was really a remarkable decision. It's very brief. I suggest everyone read it. So to me, that's a good sign. Yeah. Yeah. Sandy, do you mind if I? Yeah. I, I, did, I just wanted to say a few things. I want to make sure you covered here. This other mic's getting everything. It's just not. Oh, as is that right? Okay. It's, it's not as good a quality. Okay. So. Again, I'm, I'm Alan Matson, and I was involved in the group that put together a cooperative to try to be a local purchaser for the transaction. And going back basically to the point at which it first became clear to the community that we had significantly overspent and were using the funds from the cash pool, um, a few of us started talking about what was going to happen. And we pretty much said, well, you know, if we don't do anything, what's going to happen is going to get sold to some outside party, as has happened. So going back as far as 2010, people within the city knew that our group existed and that we were trying to do something along these lines. And um, Steve talked a lot about the transaction that was done by Merchants Bank and PCOR. And one of the big frustrations I have and continue to have to this day is that that transaction, which was extremely lucrative, um, was not shown to anyone else. I have asked a lot of people if anyone saw it. I've had many people say, how come I didn't get that transaction? And I asked them, well, did anybody talk to you? You should have been, no, you know? And so it, it was a transaction that facilitated, um, in effect, getting Citibank off to the side for a bit. Um, but it was also, again, they, uh, you know, I think the way Steve framed it with Rosemont deal being copied, you know, is a fairly accurate representation. But the other one piece I just want to re say again is that that deal was, it wasn't in, like they didn't, there was nothing competitive about it. It was ever, it was just right. done. And, you know, there's a couple other things in all this. I, I'm just going to say some facts. I'm not going to weigh in on these, but I, these are kind of facts that when I was part of a group that was really trying to succeed, I didn't highlight very much, but they're, but they're quite true. At the time the transaction was done with Merchants Bank, um, I'm fairly certain that there were three people who were on the board of Merchants Bank at the time. One was Pat Robbins, who was on the uh, Burlington Telecom Advisory Board at the time that the transaction was put forward. Another was, was on the board of Burlington Merchants Bank. Merchants Bank, okay. And, and, the telecom board. and the Burlington Telecom Advisory Board. So the next thing that, the next point I want to make also on the board was Ray Pecor, who was Trey's father. And if I remember right, Trey was also on the board of Merchants Bank at the time. Um, I know Dorman and Foss at the time also had had relationships on other transactions with Merchants Bank. And it was often presented that Merchants Bank was in the transaction in sort of doing, helping out, um, uh, you know, helping out the transaction. Um, also, in the guarantee of the loan, it was a $6 million loan that supposedly Trey had put a personal guarantee on, but the first million and a half loss was actually guaranteed by the value of the building um, on Church Street that Burlington Telecom was in at the time. So in effect, um, Trey's guarantee was only second to the uh, guarantee provided by a piece of city property at that time, uh, the Church Street building. Um, as, as I said, I'm not, I'm not going to editorialize at all. I just want to say some facts. Well, think of this, too. And you're right about that. So in reality, the city put up four and a half million plus another half. They put up six million. They put up the majority of the $10 million, got zero equity. Trey got the whole system for, for that, what he put in. Or, it, he didn't I, put I, anything I, in. I, he didn't, yeah, yeah. he didn't put anything in. He got the whole system. We put in $6 million and got nothing for that. Nothing. Um, as I said, I'm just, yeah. I, I'm just putting out some facts uh, straight, as straightforward as I can. Um, I will say that in the sale process, uh, there was a reserve price, and when the PCOR transaction was announced, um, 
because I knew there was a reserve price, I didn't know what the reserve price was, but my view on that transaction was because there was a reserve price, that was actually the full strength and control that the city held. They had the ability to sell it to whoever they wanted to above a certain price. My view was, and I said this to city officials, and city officials, I, all I can say is I said this to city officials, the reason I think that you've done this right is you maintain the control on this transaction because of that guarantee, that you can sell it for any price above a guarantee. I honestly feel as if the city, um, here's where I guess I will editorialize. They totally gave up that control in the deal process. They did not, in my frame of, my, in my mind, um, take what was the transaction that had the best value to the citizens of Burlington, but rather took, I guess what I would call the highest headline number, a decision that the decision makers could make, but it was where I felt um, that was, you know, as I'm editorializing here is where I felt particularly the decision making was wrong on this transaction. Uh, the success of Burlington Telecom while was being managed, while this whole process was going on, I think we need to remember that the citizens group was being extremely positive in what we were saying about the organization. We were telling people this is a great asset for the community. We need to keep it in the community. Don't sell out on it. Um, we were in uh, a position of actually being really good marketing, we thought, for the organization. We wanted the value, uh, we wanted the, value of the uh, company to be strong uh, as we came through the process. <coughs> Also, one of the reasons that they were able to have such strong operating um, success during that time is that they did no capital spending. You know, and that's why there was just minimal maintenance capital spending to keep the uh, process going until very late in the game and they did some small builds. But for the most part, that was a big driver in what created the excess cash that Steve uh, referenced. Um, and. So those are the four points I wanted to make. I just kind of quickly go through them again, which was the the uh, I think the it'd be great if, you could, if people had questions. Yeah, uh, the the deal silence, um, the the sale process, and what the city gave up. There was no capital spending, and you know the fact that we were really trying to bring in confidence with our group at that time. So that those are just some comments I wanted to add in on what Steve had said all the way through. Steve, let people, if you would, anybody have any questions for? For Alan right now? Sorry. Yeah, Tony. Reserve, you talked about the reserve price. Was that in the PCOR agreement? Yeah, that was in the PCOR agreement, but it had been redacted, so it was not public. The PCOR agreement, if you, you know, if you went back and looked at it, had everything it, that was just blocked out. Oh, but, it was a separate letter. Yeah, but that letter was public, Tony, and it, but it, with a redacted number. The, 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 from what you said, uh, Alan, that uh, the city could have at that point said, okay, we're going to pay that reserve price. Uh, my understanding, yes, and, and, and they did make arguments as to why they could. Which, oh, I, I, I was I that. Yeah. Yeah. Call, yeah. They said, okay, we'll need the reserve price and get the funding for it, and they, the city could have given it, could have handed over to them, keep going. They, 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 they absolutely call. could have, and, you know, we know, I mean, I think that, People did find out what the reserve price is, but we also know that our offer, and especially our ending offers, were, were more than the reserve price. Even though know one thing, though, the reserve price, the city didn't have to do that either. In other words, they could have just said, if we get you your $6 million back with interest, we're golden. That's what it could have been, instead of having to meet another reserve above that. So I don't know if that protected the city much. I think that's where the city began really to sell out when they allowed there to be a reserve price above and beyond the $6 million. Yeah. They basically doubled okay, can the I debt. Can I ask a question what, what you said uh, kind of interested Eugene, and that is that it was sabotage from the start. So why, what do you mean? Was there some ideological component to this that there couldn't, on the part of the new administration and Moreau to not have anything that smacked of uh, a public utility and rather and they deliberately sabotaged it because it was kind of a form, well, it was a form of a socialism as, in effect, public ownership is, right? I, I've pondered that. It's a very good question. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know what was in their minds, but I But you know. thought, you, you really think it was sabotage? 
Oh, well, they could have made decisions all along the way to save it. They decided yeah. not to save it. They decided to throw it away. And um, the, the early financing, uh, the sale process, we went through a, a three-year public process of the mm -hmm. public being encouraged to come up with these criteria. That at the top criteria here, number one, uh, local ownership. Number two, continued affordability of services. Number three, commitment to net neutrality. Um, uh, under this scheme, all are gone because there is no meaningful requirement that, uh, that they do anything with regard to rates. There's no meaningful requirement, there's no local control uh, to stop them from selling it in the future to Comcast. You know, right. Comcast, we fought this in the legislature in 96. We fought it in 2000 just to get the legislation in our charter to be able to do this. Comcast fought us all the way, and they had their lobbyists there fighting us all the way. They're just waiting to pick this off. So, do you really think that um, this company in Indiana is going to keep wanting to operate this utility? Well, maybe if it's super profitable, but if it's not super profitable, then it's Comcast. Uh, so, right now, it's, it's basically Comcast by another name because there's no way to enforce any of this. And from a policy level, what's happened since we started this, you know, we started trying to get a cable, you know, a municipal cable utility in the 80s uh, and, and really struggled for a very long time. Um, I started in 88, but there are people who started before me. Um, I came in after the first decision not to do it. And Wait a minute, then, yeah. You know, kept going, but the stakes meanwhile have grown so tremendously. Back then it was cable TV and a little bit of cable internet. Now it's your entire gateway to the world and commerce and politics and information and the, the fundamentals of a democracy. Mm -hmm. So the stuff that you talk about as far as free speech, these are the fundamental issues. And those stakes have, have you know, increased a thousand fold since we first started this. And right at now when we've got the FCC saying that you can't, uh, municipalities can't say anything about rates anymore. They can't wait say minute, anything wait about Wait a minute, would you funding. go over that again? That municipalities can't say anything about rates? Can't say anything about rates. Can't say anything about um, uh, requiring operators to uh, provide money for pay for public uh, educational and government. Um, and a Supreme Court ready to support them on all of this. Uh, the stakes are much, much higher. So to come in in 2013 and run on a campaign of how horrible it is that the $16.9 million was diverted from the cash pool, which is taxpayer money, uh, and then to sabotage it so that the taxpayers get between five and a half million or zero back under their plan where they want to take the five and a half million that we do get um, and then invest invest that in sure as yeah. as if there's some connection. I mean, this is just another private out of state Indiana based company, no ownership in Vermont, no control in Vermont. Yes, they put up a, a little board uh, that has no uh, uh, control whatsoever, uh, and even they, they move the administrative facilities to Indiana to consolidate them, um, and and no constraints. So the, the, it's really the policy questions that you started out with that have gotten so fundamentally uh, uh, out of whack and uh, put the people where we should never have been. Um, now, your question as to why that was done by this mayor who ran on getting the $16.9 million back, I don't know, but when you hear Steve talk about the self-dealing that was involved in these deals, uh, then you can imagine why they might be very happy to close them all out, close the books on it, be done with it completely. Uh, mission accomplished. Uh, and, and they take their money. But that, that assumes that there was a mission. That's my question. Was there a mission from day one of the uh, Weinberger administration to privatize Burlington Telecom? Yes, I believe there was. I you believe that? That's plan all along. Never keep it. Never keep it. There's one other part if you're not concerned enough about what you've heard, there is one other part to the deal. Trey Pecor is the op owner operator of the Lake Champlain Transportation Company. They run the ferries. He runs the ferries. And it's been a known thing for a long time. <coughs> he has plans for the Burlington Ferry Docks. He'd like to turn it into what I would call a waterfront resort. 
hotel, restaurants, shops, not be a ferry dock anymore. The ferries would move probably further up the shoreline of Burlington. Those plans are on file in the planning department. I've seen them. I saw them when I worked for the city. I believe that when, as a sweetener, when the mayor went to PCOR to see if he would take this deal, the mayor offered one more thing. At the time, at the time that this was going on, at the time uh, he was trying to put this deal together, there was a proposal, what do they call those proposals? Um, RFP? Yeah, what, request for a proposal. No, but there was, a, there was a PETA, what's the program called that the city had? Uh, PIPA or PIPA? It was, yep. it was proposals that people could come up with for doing certain, well, yes. whatever the process was called. There was a proposal from the Parks Department to expand Perkins Pier and expand it with about 95 additional uh, moorings and a floating breakwater. And PIAP was the process, that's what it was called. There was also a proposal from a group that was going to put a, wanted to put a marina by the water plant. And Trey Pecor's plans to deal with his property, which is right next to Perkins Pier, well, Perkins Pier expanded. A lot of his property and a lot of his dreams were going to be very hard to, to do because Perkins Pier was going to take up a lot of the room where the where the marina was going to go, and wouldn't be any room for his marina. So I believe the mayor said to Picor, well, if you go along with this, we will not do the Perkins Pier upgrade. And within the same period, within a, a one-week period, when they went to the Public Service Board to ask for the Picor approval, they also had received the grant, a grant from the federal government for the Perkins Pier work, a million and a half dollars. They deep six that grant, and never brought it up again, and they gave the group that wanted to build further north mission to do that. So I think it was all tied together. They gave, in other words, Picor, the sweetener for Picor was, we're not going to do anything with Perkins Pier in the future, and you'll be free when you come up with your proposal. That'll be available for you to do something with it. So there was one more sell out there of the, of the public. We had a grant from the federal government mm -hmm. to expand Perkins Pier, and I've never heard of this happening in the city before where a grant would be turned down. It's like impossible that would happen. And then to let another group do something further up the lake. And uh, well, we could have had something, could have had both. They could have done their thing, could have done Perkins Pier. So you're but saying then, the grant was approved, but the money hadn't? City had to accept it. The federal government had a big press release and they announced it, and the city never accepted it. In fact, it turns out the city never bothered to mention it to the Parks Commission. And uh, I believe that Jesse. Uh, Bridges, who was a park director, uh -huh. the reason he left is because he was so disgusted with what happened. Yeah, that yeah is that why? Yeah. That was the end for him. I have that on pretty good uh, reliable sources told me about that. But so that's how so this thing, is, the corruption of this, whatever, goes deeper than you can imagine. Picard got some real sweet deals right up front, but there's also the backdoor deal, which you say, well, what harm is done by any of this? Well, the citizens of Burlington Park didn't get fixed up because of it also. Now that we lost our cable system, and we also lost our ability to have our municipal uh, marina fixed up. Okay. So a lot of tentacles in this thing. Right. Yeah. Well. Can I ask a question a little bit different from where we've gone? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that I have a real interest in the history of this and, and everything, but I also have a real strong interest in potential future. Mm. Um, because there's, you know, potential futures to talk about, I think, either success with, with our community, community group, what, what happens if there's success, or what happens if there isn't success, because I have a strong interest in telecom. I believe a lot of what Solveig set up at the start of where we've come and what we control and what mm -hmm. he has talked about, the functioning democracy, and I think that there is a changing model out there, and if the citizen group succeeds, I think there's one approach, and I think if the citizens group doesn't succeed, um, I would hope that people are looking to do something as well, because I'm but, still sitting here trying to do that, but I'm kind of, I, I don't feel like the transaction is completely done, unlike well, other parties who've signed paper, and that's why I'm kind of waiting to see what happens before um, thinking about the you, future, you but I'm definitely like, thinking about the future. In the Vermont you know, Supreme Court, you mean? Yeah, yeah, so I don't know if that's something we'll get to a little bit, I just... No, I mean, we we don't know what's going to happen. Exactly. Period. You know, yeah. I don't anyway. I'll just quickly say that. I think if the citizens group succeeds, you know, I think that, um, and we've tried to keep our community, you know, the cooperative is very much just barely alive. Mm -hmm. But if it does succeed, we would want to come back forward and say, wait a minute, there needs to be something like this. If what they've said is you can't do a private transaction, 
it probably might not even be able to be a cooperative. It might have to be something even more deeply. No, I think I, I think Steve and I sort of. I've, I've heard Steve mention. I frankly think it should be owned by the city. I absolutely. I think that is actually the best solution. Yeah, to I do too. But uh, I'm a lawyer. I'm not terrifically hopeful for the Vermont Supreme Court. I'm glad others are, though. I'm glad they're doing it. I mean, I see the court, frankly, as a capitalist court that is interested in making deals happen, you know, honoring contracts and all that stuff. I hope I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. I really hope I'm wrong. But who knows? And I think if it doesn't succeed... If it doesn't succeed, I think we should come back with... Well, I think we should force the mayor to own it, to have the city own it again. The only way you can do that is, I guess, get rid of him, right? I don't know. Yeah, and or I mean, I think idea. or there could what? be an alternative. It's a good idea. Anyway. Alternative. Excuse me, Lou. I just said it's a good idea anyway. Well, I don't want to be that partisan at this point, but. But I think that I would look at it. I would be looking for another community-based alternative yeah. Yeah. that we might be able to bring yeah. forward. Yeah. And I think that it could be. I mean, I'll just quickly say, you know, I think Newport, Vermont, for example, right now is doing. Um, you know, they've got a public map mesh that they're trying to put in their lowest socioeconomic areas of town. And I think there's some ideas there that we have talked about a bit. Certainly a lot of similarities going. between yeah. Burlington and Newport you, right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> right? So anyway, I think that we want to keep thinking through this, yeah. even no, yeah. no matter what happens, because this telecom point that Dean gets to of it being right. this window into the world for us these days, an important one, since yeah. since the media seems so absolutely screwed up. Are there are there any final thoughts or questions? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, this is so. This is the first time I've heard this sort of history in this much yeah. detail, and I forgive if I missed a little bit of detail. But Here, if Steve, would you? yeah, go ahead. Would quickly explain again who Trey Trey Pecor is and how he became involved, and then what's the relationship to. Uh, Dorman and Fawcett and, uh, and Merchants Bank. Trey's a local businessman. His father, Ray Pecor, amongst other things, runs a lake, or ran the Lake Champlain Transportation Company, and now Trey and he runs that. The baseball team. And he also owned a cable system way back in the, was it, the mountain cable. I forget the name of it. I think it was the Islands. Green oh, Mountain. Island. Ray owned yeah. at some point, but this Green is his Island. son now. Yeah. And his, Ray is, I don't think he's retired yet, but he probably is in semi retirement. So Trey is the business side of that operation. And the mayor went to him to see if he would do what this company, Rosemont, said they were going to do, basically. Here's the deal. Here's what it looks like. Would you do this? So which, Trey... Which was, which was basically mm -hmm. invest $6 million to keep... Come Rome up with $6 million. Flow, dollars. And then there yeah. was a deal in place to... Except Rosemont was going to come up with the $6 million. Right. What Trey did was he went to the Merchants Bank, which he was on the board of, and he basically arranged us to get a loan. He co-signed on it, but it was a loan to the city of Burlington, a 30-year mortgage for six million dollars. Mm -hmm. That's what he arranged. But he also arranged to get a huge percentage of the sale proceeds when it was sold. And he also set a minimum sale price so that he would get at least a certain amount. In the end, it exceeded that amount. And is, uh, is that how Dorman and Fawcett came to be involved? Dorm, no, Dorman and Fawcett was actually brought in by the Kiss administration when this Tim Nolte I mentioned earlier, when they finally got rid of him. They brought in Dorman and Fawcett and they, they ran the system. I'm not sure what the allure of them was because they were not a cable management company of any sort. I can speak a little bit to that one. They were known as a turnaround company yeah. and had done a number of other transactions within the state. And that's also how they had a connection with Merchants Bank. I think that some of the other turnaround transactions they had done, they had used Merchants Bank for some of their financing, so had relationships with Merchants Bank already. When Dorman Fawcett was brought in, let's not also forget they brought in the folks um, from Winona, who were telecom operators, who really were the folks who brought the expertise in yeah. at the time, from Winona, Minnesota. Um, Hiawatha Broadband, the management from Hiawatha Broadband really is where the expertise came, and they, they're the folks who trained Stephen Barakow, yeah. who was a Dorman and Fawcett hire, uh, to do this particular turnaround. Yeah. And, and so Dorman and Fawcett got a slice of the eventual sale. But well, the not, initially they didn't. Initially they came in, they worked for the KISS administration, and then when Moreau Weinberg came along, they stayed. They were, became a trusted manager of the system. But during the negotiations of the deal with PCOR, they somehow ended up getting a, a share of the profits or whatever. They, up until that point, they weren't getting that. They were just getting, they were just getting paid and getting well paid, in fact, for what their work yeah. was. Okay.
Yeah, I'm sorry, Ron. Yeah, um, it seems to me that um, out of this uh, fascinating conversation, I, I could see some sort of a future session or class or something that would write a power chart of our community. Okay, you have Pomelo, you have Picor, you have Picor's son, you have Pat Robbins, you have the bank, you have the, that a chart, like who's loaning who what. And this is just, we've been talking about just Mark. one one of these nuggets of wealth in this community that has been basically manipulated by the the ruling class here. And, you know, let's, let's have analysis of the whole system somehow. I don't know how I we would do Robin's that. I think Robin's actually hit on a, a, something that has really intrigued me as well, and I would second that it would be a great idea to it work was, through. Didn't uh, the cynic once do that back in the... It might have way back, but yeah. yeah. Anyway, it was the players are really different now, but same idea. Yeah. The rich get richer. In the 80s. Yeah. Anyway, Robin, did you want to say anything further? No. Okay, anything else? It's approaching 7.30, so anybody have anything in cl con conclusion to say? Well, think about the next one, yeah. um, the big hole, um, how I think we could do more publicity than, I mean, I think this is a good turnout, but can we bring some people who, uh, other people who might not know all the details. I mean, these guys from the big hole have been around to all the MPAs, right? So in a way, we no, put their rap. No? No, no. <coughs> I mean, and, but they basically Wait a minute, what, what was that? Pardon? You, you were thinking that this presentation by these folks has gone around to all the MPAs? Is that some of them, ha they have to some yeah. of them. From, yeah. yeah. They haven't, they yeah. haven't, but... The mayor has, though. The mayor has, but we have. Yeah, oh, the mayor has, okay. So... No, wait, wait. Anyway, so the next I think, meeting I think is about... I think about different oh, issues yeah, we're different about different groups. People talking making about, presentations. You're, you're, she's talking about the, the big hole. Yes, and so is she. Oh. But yeah. she's yeah. Like, we're talking, we're talking about, about tonight's oh. presentation. Yeah. No. Well, we'll what if we tonight's presentation went to all the entities? It has not. We have spoken no. to uh, Ward 1, and so. eight and uh, word six and two and three. Over time, we've, we've spoken to those MPAs. Obviously, not in the detail we're talking about. No. No. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think that we should do that if we could, if they'd let us on the agenda in the first place, would they? I guess, I guess they'd put us on. However, I think that we should probably think through it maybe closer to the election. Well, and, and as a practical matter, yeah. Uh, this Friday is the deadline for us to file re reply briefs at the Supreme Court. Yeah. At some point, we don't have the schedule yet, there's going to be the oral argument. Right. And at some point, the Supreme Court's going to make a decision. Right. If right. they throw it out, then the city has to do something to start over again, um, more or less. Um, and I think that it might even raise the question of whether the 2014 agreement, which is what Steve's been describing, uh, is even legal. Um, mm -hmm. And it might be the impetus for going around and talking to people about this issue anew uh, and trying to reconstruct our Burlington Telecom. Uh, and or, if we fail at the Supreme Court, going around, as Alan said, and put together the people and the technology to create a, a different local system uh, <coughs> that we can democratically control. Yeah. Okay, so what you're suggesting is perhaps that we should meet again those people who are interested after the decision. Right, well, and maybe yeah. before then too, because I'm, it might we don't know what yeah, it's going to be. Yeah. I mean, I want to say a word about getting the word out. Mm -hmm. which having tonight's presentation go to every NPA is one way to get the word out. Um, and what I want to say is I, I think that the sooner the better mm -hmm. for getting the word out because we want to get the word out as broadly as we can prior to, we want as many citizens to, to have some of the essence of what we've all learned tonight about this history. We'd like as many citizens as possible to have that information before the Supreme Court um, 
comes up with its ruling. Well, it's what not going to affect the Supreme Court. Well, it won't affect the Supreme Court, but No, I'm not saying context. it will affect the Supreme Court. I'm saying that wh whenever the Supreme Court comes out with its thing, we would like as many Burlington people as possible to already know this, to have this information as a context exactly. for hearing. Because like what yes. Brian yes. said, I mean, the, there. Yeah, people, and, and, people and, don't know much. But guess and what? It, he recorded it. Well, I know. And the, so but the context the of this yeah. issue, yeah. which I think people are surprised at the, the sheer level of crookedness that mm -hmm. went on. Mm -hmm. And then when you hear about the big hole, right. and, and the level of crookedness that went on there, and the when F -35s. you hear about City Hall Park, mm -hmm. uh, and the then F -35s. you start to get a very yes. powerful picture yes. that could really motivate Burlingtonians to solve a lot of these problems, right. if not all of them. Well, that's sort of the purpose, isn't it, of what yeah, we're so trying to do? Thank you. No, I mean, <laughs> me true. and Rob, Robin. Did too. this get into some days? Yes, it did. Okay. Did the whole brochure do it? No, well, no, tonight's uh, presentation was in there, in the calendar. Man, Manny Leone just published a, an issue of 05401, which is a compendium of the crimes and sins of Miro Weinberg. <laughs> there are about five articles in there. So in the, I hadn't seen this one yet. Well, it, it must, must have just come out. out. I just seen it. Is it out now? I, yeah, I saw a copy of it. So uh, at the Y. <laughs> and and one should be soul based. Huh? One of the articles should be soul based about BTS. Yes, right. Yeah. Right. So um, get that out. Kit. So I know Robin wants to talk about the next um, event, which is important. But I, I also I just want to say a little bit more about getting the word out. Mm -hmm. So um, so this is being recorded, and I had a thought while I was listening to this presentation about watch parties. Like when something gets on Channel 17, then it gets run and rerun and rerun a number of times, am I right? Yep. And um, Mark and I know, right Mark? We so, do a program together. So what if watch parties were organized? In fact, what if there were a big watch party organized in Contois? If you want to do it, that would be great. If you want to get it together, that would be terrific. I'm, I'm throwing it out yeah. for everyone yeah. to hear because I am not in a position to get anything together single-handedly. Right. But this um, recording will have a URL, and that URL yeah. can be sent out by everybody to everybody's unique list. Oh. Right? Yes. And right. so everything that went on tonight can be available. Um, for people to, to watch on to their own up. time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that I think is the first step, right? Uh, is to use, I mean, that's one of the reasons that we're devoted, I'm devoted to this issue, is because of public access. So the more we use it, the more it would become so important that people wouldn't want to lose it. You right? know, the other people who should be <clears throat> publicizing this is um, Rights and Democracy. I've given it to them. You did? Yeah, okay. I did. I met with them this week. Okay. Yeah. So there's one last way to get the, I mean, there's many ways, but there's one other way that I'm thinking of to get the word out broadly, and that's the thing I've brought up a number of times, of a citywide leaflet that goes to every door in the city, including every business door, because when we did door knocking um, for the KBTL effort, we learned that businesses, small businesses throughout Burlington loved BT and were I know. really upset about being sold. Right. So anyway, that's something we've talked about before, it's come up before, and um, I, I, don't, I don't know if there's a big enough group that could pull it off, but I just wanted to say it one more time because I know that when you get a leaflet into every single door, residential and business, a lot of them don't get read. This a needs lot to of be them redone get before thrown it's put out. out. Before but what? Before it's put out, it has some serious typos in it, including misspelling the name of one of the groups. Okay, so that's. That might, yeah, that might I'm, not be. If, if that's correct, I, Diane, tell me about it. 
I'm talking about yeah. a leaflet that yeah. will give the yeah. basics of the BT story. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I know that a lot of them just go into recycling, but I also know that certain individuals read the thing and get educated and get some of them activated who we never could reach if if we didn't do that. So I have a suggestion because that, that has, I, you've suggested it's a great suggestion. No one has taken it up. No one has written a pamphlet. And I don't know if we have the hordes of people to deliver it. However, we should be thinking about elections. You know, we really should be. And we should do something like that during the electoral period, I think educating on all of these issues. Yeah. Well, and also, as this series continues, yes. the number yes. of people yes. potentially involved in that effort yep. for a serial issue-by-issue issue, uh, leaflet right. approach will right. grow. Yeah, I yeah. think so. I hope so. The people will be larger. I mean, that's the point, yeah. Yeah, so uh, what I'm wondering is, do people know uh, other people that it would be good to come to the big hole discussion. I mean, John Franco is wonderful and eloquent, but are there other big players that would be interesting just, if you know, to be personally invite them to come so that we can have a, a broad discussion? Uh, Barbara? Oh? Uh, I, don't know. I, don't, I don't know the other people who've been involved. Well, Steve and I are plaintiffs. Who else are the plaintiffs, Steve? For the Michael big hole? Yeah. No, against it. Lynn who? Michael Long, Lynn Martin. Well, we could get Michael Long for sure. I'm Michael just thinking Long, to the teacher. Pardon? Michael Long, who was the teacher at Colchester uh, High School? No, no, I think so. Different Michael Long. Teacher. Yeah. Anyway, just be, um, you know, talk to <clears throat> friends, invite them to come because I think it would be good if we could have like you and know, there were discussions. And there'll be that discussion in two weeks, not next week, but two weeks. Any okay, other? I started to sign up. Yeah, it's sheets. right here. Did it go all the way around? No, because I didn't have a pen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Especially if you're so good at uh, Okay, media, so. Which we haven't done that well. Why don't you grab it on the Sandy and the. Uh, okay. <clears throat> okay. Any final thoughts? Any, you think it's an important issue? What? What do we think? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what? Go ahead, I'm sorry. I guess what I was just going to say is, you know, I. I had not looked at the full slate of issues. Um, Robin had encouraged me to come tonight. And um, what I want to say is, I don't check the box on all these issues that um, I get worked up about them. And I think that that's important too, but I, there's a lot of them that I do, and I want to come out and mm -hmm. get more actively talking about it. I mean, I've been joking with people that we need to we need to come up with a group, you know, keep the big hole local. You know, it's just like... <laughs> <laughs> it took a little while to sink in, but I kind of hit. But that's sort of the idea, too. Yes. And some of these things really do resonate. Not everything's going to resonate with everybody. And so we do want to find the people who, you know, who else can we get to come up to every one of these particular issues and who are the, who are the folks. I think that's good because I think this next one was related to the downtown project. We could Which really find some, uh, the big hole. The hole. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 we could really find some um, connection to a lot of people. And I think that the more we do this, uh, you know, like I said, everybody's not going to hit on all of them. But the more people we motivate, they're going to start realizing all the other connections that exist, too. Can I just say one final word about what was in my mind, at least? There's a, there's a huge movement, huge. There's a movement internationally for cities to have control over their resources and over their democracy. Yeah. Cities sort of try to create an alternate power somewhere um, outside the power of the nation state or the federal government. That's what I have in mind, is having this city be in control mm -hmm. of itself and not be selling off its resources, but not also ignoring the fact that every citizen has to have input into what happens. And that is, you know, and that's why I labeled this this first thing, municipalism, because it's happening in Barcelona, it's happening in Spain, it's happening in a lot of places. That that's the only place that we can have power. We can't have power against Donald Trump, really, in the end, probably not. But we could have power over our city, couldn't we? Yeah, I like that. Seems thing. to me. Okay, good. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you, Rob. Yes.